Today, Lior Raken and Stephanie Wolfson will be our guides through an exhibit that is currently on display in the Leatherby Libraries at Chapman. Unfortunately, as we all know, due to the virus, the exhibit is not physically accessible. So we're very glad for this opportunity to virtually connect to these special works of art. I'll keep my introduction of our two speakers very brief so that we have as much time as possible for the presentation, as you see before you, Art and Isolation, the works of David Lakofsky. Lior Raken was born and grew up in South Africa. She has lectured widely on the Jews of South Africa and on the art of her great uncle, David Lakofsky. She is the founder of the David Lakofsky Project, whose mission is to educate through the art of her great uncle. His art includes portrayals of life before the Holocaust, especially in Vilna, his time in Siberia under Stalin, and the post-war renewal of life that he experienced. As you will soon see, it is not only a story from history, it is a message of hope as we face difficult and sometimes frightening times today. Stephanie Wolfson is Director of Education and Curation in the David Lakofsky Project. She holds an MA in Jewish Education and Community Service from Brandeis University and has presented widely on topics of Holocaust and Jewish education. Our moderator will be my colleague, Jessica Milamuk, who has recently been selected and participated in a conference for Holocaust education centers at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She holds an MA from Chapman University and is the Associate Director of the Rogers Center. And so with that, I will turn our presentation over to Jessica. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, thank you all for being with us today. And I see that there's a note there about not having audio. I'll address that in just a moment. Um, there's a few words I want to say about the format before we begin. Um, we are recording this presentation. It will be available shortly on YouTube as soon as it's done, obviously. And all of the folks who have registered um, will receive a link, a notification. So just keep an eye on your mailbox for that. Um, we will be, for the duration of the, the presentation, we will be muting all of the guests as well as disabling video. Um, so that way we can allow our, pres our presenters um, all of our attention. During the interaction, interactive portions of the presentation, we're gonna ask that you use your chat box. So if you don't have a chat screen on your right-hand side of your screen, just go ahead and hover your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom screen and it should have a little chat with like a, cartoon bubble. If you click on that, it'll pop up on the right hand side, a panel, and you can go ahead and, and do your um, interactive portion there, as well as write any questions you have, because we do have time at the end uh, for a Q&A session, and we will be taking questions at that time. Um, if you guys have questions as it goes, as the presentation is going, please feel free to, do, to put your questions in right away. You don't need to wait until the question and answer session. So with that, um, I'm hoping that that answers the, the audio issue that we saw earlier that we're just gonna go ahead and keep everyone muted. I am gonna go ahead and turn the presentation, the reins over to Leora. Center for Holocaust Education, Dr. Marilyn Haran and Jessica Marmalak for sponsoring today's virtual lecture, Art and Isolation, the works of David Lovkovsky. I'm Leora Raikin, founder and executive director as well as the great niece of the artist, David Lovkovsky. And I spent time with him during his lifetime, both in Israel and in South Africa. Today, we will be exploring the concept of art and isolation, using selections from Lovkovsky's over 400 pieces of art, his personal experience of isolation, extreme isolation, solitary confinement, which he experienced. And we will see how he depicts these events through his art. While art is a tool to educate, 
It also provides a way to process information and experiences, whether at the time of their occurrence or decades after. During our darkest times, we turn to art to express our deepest emotions. Throughout the presentation, we will be asking for your thoughts. Please feel free to write them in the chat box. We will be exploring Lafkowski's life, his art, and how his art reflected both his emotional state of mind and his physical being. We will see paintings and sketches that combine the past and the present, light, darkness, shadows, memory. Lafkowski illustrates the juxtaposition of different feelings, emotions, time, and place probably best illustrated by the image you see in front of you. David Lapkowski, in his later years, he's sitting in front of a mirror and he's drawing himself, but he's drawing his thoughts as well. He's drawing himself in the background and his family and how they lived in Vilna before the war. He's a man isolated in his own mind with the people and community from his past. In order to fully understand his art, we need to understand how to read the art. I would like to invite Stephanie Wilson, our Director of Education, to share with us how to read David Lovkovsky's narrative art. I'm Stephanie Wolfson, Director of Education for the David Lovkovsky Project. Narrative art is art that tells a story. When you read a story, you're introduced to a main character. It's the same in paintings. When you look at this piece, what is the subject that you, that you see? Write in your comment book, comment uh, chat, some things that you think about this piece, please. When we work with middle school students, they often say that she's a witch. Uh, when we work with high school students, they'll say she is a poor beggar woman. And now I'm starting to see some comments that she is feeding a family. And in fact, a Holocaust survivor with tears in his eyes once said, it's his mother holding a pot of chulant, a traditional stew eaten on um, the Jewish Sabbath. And let's see what else, a hard worker. Very good. Elderly, loneliness. Yes, the hunch. So let's talk about the hunch for a minute in her back here. That's his use of line. And by showing us this, the line and that curve is indeed showing us that life is maybe hard for this person. And um, I would say the same is true if you look at her hands. So his use of, let me see what else we have. The um, Yes, that she looks poor. So the, what are the clues that you see that are making you feel that way? And the, the clues are really his use of paint colors, his use of line, like we just talked about with the curve of, his, the, of her spine, the way that he uses shadow, and the way that he uses foreground and background. That we, we all bring with us a relation, our own thoughts about a piece that we create our own relationship with each piece deciphering the meanings. We look at Lepkowski's art like an onion, that you peel back the layers to get a deeper understanding. Lepkowski is really a genius at his use of space. So for example, I'm going to ask if you can quickly write if you think the character is inside or outside. and type it in your chat box. Okay, so we have inside, inside, outside. So there's a question, right? When we look at the foreground and we look at the background, what is he trying to tell us? What is he saying about this character? And why is it so unsure of whether she's inside or outside? So we look at, yes, see, all right, so I'm good. The people are starting to look at it in a different way, which is exactly what we want you to do. Take a deeper look at each piece. So individually, each of his pieces tells their own story. But when they're linked together, a greater narrative comes to light. 
It would be like putting chapters in a book together to tell a complete story. So now let's look at this piece. What do you think the subject is here? Okay, good, ghetto life, a market day, community. Excellent, excellent answers. Uh, people in a village. Okay, well, um, the, and, and now as you're writing, tell me some of the clues that are letting you, leading you to this idea. Because what we do know, in fact, this is Vilna, and we know this by the building in the background, right here, which is the great synagogue of Vilna. It would be like seeing the Disney Concert Hall and knowing it's Los Angeles. In fact, this piece represents 1929 in Vilna. It's entitled The Rag Market, and it is sharing a slice of life for the Jewish community in the shadow of the Great Synagogue. But let's take an even closer look. So when we see this detail of the painting that we just saw, what do you notice? You notice the shawl, thank you, yes. So when we see that shawl, we might even recognize it. Yep, hold on, there. From our first painting that we were looking at. So what does it mean that Lepkowski is showing us the characters repeating, or at least the shawl that we saw repeating itself, right? So we can see that does it change your interpretation of the first painting to see her in the second painting? Yes, thank you, the lady with the shawl. Great answers. Yes, it does. It definitely can change your interpretation. So when we're working with younger students and the middle school students who thought she was a witch, now see this character as a part of a community. And that is exactly what David Lepkowski's art does when you connect the narrative together and watch it grow. He tells us so much about if we, as if we're peeling back an onion. So now if we looked in the lower left corner of the large city scene, we see David Lepkowski himself. So one of the things that he does that's so genius as you peel back the onion is compare his clothing to this gentleman's clothing. We see that he is dressed in a more modern style uh, with, than this gentleman. He's carrying a canvas where the other man is carrying his wares in the marketplace. David Lepkowski is showing us the complexities of the time. And all of these things were issues, the, the growing modernity and how it was going to fit in the community. The things that people in this community were facing were all in his paintings if you peel back the layers. So as we go through today's presentation, please really read the pieces of his visual diary that he left us. Read the works on the screen and go ahead and keep jotting your comments. Um, there is a child I'm seeing holding a parent's hand in the background. They, it is daily life. It is exactly what you would expect in a marketplace. So those are perfect responses. So keep doing that as the presentation unfolds. So Lavkovsky grew up in Vilna and he grew up in the city when it was the epicenter of the Jewish world. In fact, it was known as the Jerusalem of the North. Jewish life existed there for five centuries. There were hundreds of synagogues, places of Jewish learning. The community was diverse. You had Orthodox, you had Socialists, you had Buntists, um, you had Zionists, you had many, many different groups, and they coexisted in Vilna. It was also the epicenter of this Jewish world, the greatest scholars, the Vilna Gaon, this is where they lived. But the center of this place, the center of the marketplace, the center of life, really congregated around the great synagogue could accommodate up to 5,000 people.
and surrounding the synagogue, the main synagogue, were smaller little shuls or synagogues. And depending on what um, organization and what trade you had, whether you were a, a blacksmith or a butcher, um, you would go to those different temples, synagogues um, surrounding the great synagogue. And this is the, the environment in which David Lakovsky grows up. And he wants to show us the normalcy, the everydayness of this environment, of people going out, shopping, meeting a friend, chatting with a friend, purchasing herring from a herring seller, praying, talking, reading, visiting the library, having a drink. He wanted to portray this very normal, everyday life. And before this, this time, um, one can often think, what is so special about the normalcy, the ordinary? And yet we find ourselves today in a situation where we can't go out and meet a friend for coffee. We can't just congregate in large groups. And we're seeing an intense appreciation for this normalcy. But this community of Lovkovsky, he's very committed to it, he's attached to it, and he grows up in the, in the Vilna community. He's a member of Jung Vilna. With, he mixes with other artists and writers. And in 1932, he leaves Vilna and he goes to live in the Soviet Union. And his brother had already gone. Um, his brother, both uh, Shmuel and Moshe, are already in the Soviet Union. We can see a picture of David on the far right-hand side. You'll see the ear. He often pronounces his ear in um, his self-portraiture. And even though he doesn't paint and illustrate his early time in the Soviet Union, we have photographs that document this time. So David is in the Soviet Union and he actually goes to work at the State Jewish Theater in Moscow. And this is also where Chagall used to work. But more than anything, David really wants to be a professional artist. And so he applies and he's accepted into the Art Academy in Leningrad. And finally, he's, he's living this amazing dream of actually being living, working, and learning to be an artist. But we have to look at this in the context of what is going on in the world. And World War II has just broken out, and um, Russia is part and fighting in the war, and they need every able-bodied man to fight for them. And David Lovkovsky is actually taken out of the art academy, and he's forced to enlist in the Red Army. Once again, we need to think about the context. Who is the ruler of the Soviet Union during this time? It's Stalin. What do we know about Stalin? We know that he's a dictator. We know that he's paranoid. We know that he's responsible for sending millions and millions of his own people to their death. And during this time, Anybody can be accused of just about anything, and it falls under so-called anti-Soviet activity. And David Lovkovsky is accused of being anti-Soviet, and he's taken out of the Red Army, and he is sent to the Lubyanka jail in Moscow. And this begins his probably most honest and brutal and graphic portrayal of his personal experience, his personal isolation, his emotional and his physical struggles being a prisoner. So the Lubyanka prison in Moscow, a very notorious prison, David Lovkovsky spends 10 months in that prison. How do we know it was 10 months? Because a year ago, Stephanie, was able to uncover a KGB document with his actual date that he was sent to prison and the date that he was sentenced to Siberia. I want you to watch carefully these pictures 
and these images and the self-portraiture of David Dabkovsky's experience as a prisoner, his experience of self-isolation while he's in Siberia. And for those that may know, Siberia is a brutal, brutal climate. In order to survive, in order to receive any food, every prisoner needed, needed to produce a certain output of work, specifically um, chopping down very, very high and tall fir trees in brutal climatic conditions. And every day, prisoners would be sent out to chop down these trees. You can see in this picture that there's a guard with a gun um, forcing them, marching them, making sure that they stay in a particular direction. You can also see that David Lavkovsky, along with all the other prisoners, has a food bucket attached to them at all times. We can still see his face at this point. We can still see where his eyes would be. And I want you to remember that as we progress through these pictures. Self-portraiture is one of the hardest forms of art. It forces you to be honest in a way unlike anything else. David Lovkovsky describes not only his physical environment, but he's sharing with you his mental state at that point in time. He's not only telling you about what he did during the day, he's telling you what happened at night. He's sharing with you what it was like to try and sleep, to try and get some peace, to try and get some rest. And we see these intense cramped conditions that the prisoners had to endure, one on top of each other, a hard plank to lie on. There's no pillow, there's no blanket, you can see the restlessness, the, the pain of not being able to actually sleep properly. Not only that, the food bucket had to be attached to you at all times. Why do you think that would be the case? And feel free to write in the comment section. If you were lucky enough to have shoes, you slept with them on. And as you can see from the man lying at the top of the bunk, He's got a hole in his shoe. We don't know what happens to that man, whether he gets frostbite, whether his foot has to be amputated, but they're living in minus 40 degrees, very limited food, unsanitary conditions, and major lice inf infestation. But life gets worse for David Lovkovsky, physically, and emotionally. The hard labor outside without any gloves, being watched by a guard tower in the back. And even if you could escape, you'd go into mass dense forests in a negative 40 environment. I want you to look at this picture and tell me what you think when you look at his eyes and when you look at his hands. What emotion do you think that he is feeling at this point in time? And the answers are, your responses are wonderful. Stress, uncertainty, anxiety, worry. And we look at the next image of the beginning to understand his relationship with food. And in this picture, there's a bowl. You can see that this man who's in his early 30s is now looking much older. He's hunched over and he's got the spoon and the focus on the bowl and on the spoon. And there's this lack of, there's this lack of food, but it actually becomes even worse. And later on, we see how he holds the bowl and the spoon so, so very close. Is he scared that somebody would steal it, take away the food? What would one do for food in this environment? But I want you to also notice his eyes and his sockets. 
Is he still there? And if we look at these images, his hair shaven due to the lice, he's looking at you. And then it becomes worse. Worried, gaunt. We try to still look into his soul. And then his own experience of solitary confinement, hunched into a 72 inch space, neither able to walk or stand, completely, completely isolated. You cannot even see his facial expression. So David Lovkovsky survives World War II by being a prisoner in Siberia. And after the war, he is released and he's allowed to go back to Vilna, back to the city where he grew up, back to what he believes is this community in which he flourished. And what does he find in 1945? He finds complete devastation and destruction. 95% of the Jewish community have been murdered. And as an artist, he starts drawing this destruction. And even in this destruction, we still see the great synagogue, which had not been totally destroyed. But we see this absolute devastation. We see the destruction. And most importantly, Think about what we don't see. We do not see people. And that is the starkest, starkest contrast to life before, to life after. So when he shows us this synagogue, it, as it is in this painting, and you can see the uh, photograph of the destruction of Vilna, the synagogue actually did look like that, and it did survive the war. It was very heavily damaged. The Soviet army liberated Vilna in 1944, and then remained as occupiers in the city until 1991. The surviving Jewish community, or those that, like Lipkowski, returned from the Gulag, created a museum dedicated to the victims of the Holocaust. Soon after its creation, the Soviet government closed the museum. Still, the community petitioned the government to repair the roof and save the building. The Soviets refused. They raised the building and put a school on the site. A generation has grown up in Vilnius without knowing what was there as they dropped and picked, off their, picked up their children from school. Around two years ago, the Jewish community worked with the government of Lithuania. They closed the school and began to excavate the site. They've uncovered the foundation of the bima and the stepping stones of the courtyard. Evac excavations will continue and they, will con they are looking into a plan for what the, the future of the site will hold. So as an artist, in addition to documenting the devastation and destruction, David documented with paintbrushes what had happened to the Jewish community of Vilna. And the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union was in June 1941. Within a week of the Nazi invasion, when, with the help of the Lithuanian collaborators, Jews were rounded up off the streets by people called snatchers or catchers. They were taken to the forest of Ponar, a park just outside Vilna, where they were shot into mass pits. If we look at this image, Lavkovsky only shows the face of one little girl and the profile of one man. And even though this is a group of people, each one alone in their thoughts, not quite knowing their fate that lies ahead. If we look at the trees that surround the forests of Ponara, these beautiful, tall trees, each one that stands alone. 
each one that has witnessed the most terrible atrocities. And these are the trees that surround the mass killing pits in Vilna, in Ponar today. In September 1941, the Jews of Vilna, including my great grandparents that you see in this picture, along with my great aunt and her, two, and her twin five and a half year old boys, were forced out of their homes. They could only take what they could carry, old and young, forced to walk to the newly established Vilna ghetto. Cramped, crowded, all the Jews were forced into this confined space. And we see this so clearly in both the expressions and the size of the buildings that the people are almost trapped, which they were trapped in this confined, confined space, forced to wear yellow stars. And yet together, but the anxiety, the concern, the worry is palatable. Even the children, Lapkowski wants us to know, even the children were impacted severely. We see here a little boy carrying a little girl, no shoes, wearing the yellow star, and a man in the distance, not looking, is it indifference? Is he oblivious? Or are his concerns so great that he cannot even look at what these children are experiencing? We know what happens to the Jews of Vilna. Most of them are taken to the forest of Ponar and there they are stripped of their clothing and they are shot into mass pits. Some of them are transported to concentration camps. And we see here mothers and children desperately trying to soothe each other, comfort each other, and yet the anxiety and concern is real. So David and Rivka live in Vilna, Lithuania from 1945 until 1958. During this time, they're not allowed to talk about their experience in Siberia. They're not allowed to talk about what happened during the Holocaust. They're not allowed to practice being Jewish. They are desperate to leave and they petition and they finally given permission to go and live in Israel. And in 1959, David has his first art exhibition. Here, he has documented the horrors of the Holocaust, the death of the Jewish community, and how Jewish life used to be before. Artistically, it is highly reviewed and critically acclaimed. Emotionally, the world and society are not yet ready to confront the horrific, horrific images. David and Rivka are devastated by society's reaction. Here, they had seen themselves staying alive, their purpose as being ones of documenting. And yet when they showed the work, people just weren't ready to confront it and to look at it. They felt more alone than ever before. David and Rivka lived in Israel. They moved to the artist colony in Sfat. And in his later years, he reached a sense of peace, renewal, and an incredible appreciation for everyday life. And we see that reflected in his pieces of fruits and flowers and landscapes of Jerusalem and Sfat, and a sense of spiritual renewal and peace came into his life. But at the same time, never forgetting the past, 
never forgetting the community of Vilna and never forgetting his own experiences and what he had endured. David Lavkovsky left us a visual diary. I'm gonna invite Stephanie to share with you what the David Lavkovsky project has done with this visual diary. So we use David Lepkowski's art as a tool to educate students from middle school through adults and, un and university. Classes are charged with reading his work and connecting the pieces to tell his story within historical context. The leading question we ask is what would you need to know to create an exhibit of his work? The inquiry is their own. The need to find the answers has a real application in putting together an exhibit. Students become curators, learning the history, putting source material, including diaries and testimonies to each piece of artwork, and then connecting the pieces to meet the themes for their exhibit. They must work together, making decisions about the rationale for their exhibit. What are the lessons we wanna share with our community? Why is this story important? And how do we wanna tell it? We then ask the students, especially because this material is so difficult to process, to reflect on the artwork and the history. And as part of the program, students write poetry and paint in Lepkowski style. The final product is always incredible, watching the students shine, speaking publicly and sharing their knowledge. In fact, and very scary, we have had numerous parents tell us that they did not know this history before their child began working with us. We really are making a difference, one student, one school, one community at a time. Given that museums and our exhibits are not going to be open um, until probably the end of summer, tonight we're launching an online exhibit entitled Documenting History Through Art, the Work of David Lipkowski. Lipkowski. This exhibit takes audiences through the narrative of David Lipkowski's life, as you've just heard, detailing his life before, during, after the Holocaust, as well as his time in Israel. For teachers, we can provide a unit of study, of study to accompany the exhibit and uh, one that they can use in their online platform for teaching. The DLP has resources and materials. We're here for you educators at this difficult time of online teaching. After this program, tonight you can uh, see this program and also the Rogers Center Holocaust Commemoration and uh, Remembrance on the uh, youtube.com at the Rogers Center. And our virtual exhibit, you can find the link on davidlipkowskiproject.org. And um, we would like to uh, open it up to questions. I would like to just say, that your comments, I've been reading them as we've been going, have been so moving and really you can see how much uh, reading of the art you're doing and what you're getting out of it by your comments. Um, really terrific. So thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. So, Jessica, do you want to open to questions? Yeah, so right now, if you guys have any questions, I did see that there was one, and I know Leora touched on it with the, the slides showing kind of some of the, the date ranges, but Leora, would you mind just kind of maybe giving a little timeline, because I know that there was a little confusion earlier about um, when the paintings were created, when the artwork was created. Somebody had asked if he had hidden them while he was in prison, and then others were asking, did he do them all after the war? So maybe you could just go over that really quickly. Sure. So most of the art he does in or afterwards, but some of the pieces, for example, the one from Saber uh, when he's in prison in 1941, that he did when, when he was in prison in 1941. Um, the one where he's crouched into a ball, that was in 1978 that he did that image. And when I look at these dates, um, I think it's, it's so profound because he experienced the experience of this complete isolation, the solitary confinement in, in the 1940s. And yet some of these experiences, he was only really able to process 
in terms of drawing, drawing it and recovering and revisiting that pain three decades later. So the past is always with him. Most of the pictures he does from recollection, from memory. He had a photographic memory. And many of the characters are people that were part of his life, that were part of this community. And he depicts them over and over again in the art. Um, the earliest known piece um, is from 1929. And um, his last piece that he actually drew himself was in 1987. Um, he painted this beautiful, beautiful bouquet of flowers um, as a gift to his wife Rivka for her birthday. After that, he suffered from arthritis and could no longer paint. And how very difficult for an artist not to be able to, to paint and to, to use their hands. And we had another question asking whether or not um, his artwork is showcased at any galleries or museums. Um, and I know that, I know the answer, but maybe others would like to know as well. So we currently have two exhibits open at the moment. One is at the Leatherby Library um, at Chapman, and the other is at Kill Lutheran University at the Quanfong Gallery. And these exhibits are both open in buildings that have been shut down due to the coronavirus. And this art, this body of art, um, in its own way, is experiencing its own form of isolation. An artist draws and paints and depicts, but the purpose is to communicate. And without an audience, communication is very difficult. And that was one of the reasons that we have launched this online exhibit. So people can view, they, they can learn, that they can process this, this, this information um, through this, this body of artwork. I also had another question that popped up asking where you're located. And perhaps you can also include, because I know your location doesn't always, um, isn't always, just where you do your work. You're, you're much larger than that. So if you can maybe share where your, your location is, but also all the different places that you reach with your programs. So we've taken both the exhibit and our educational program to Vilnius, Lithuania, to Mexico City, to South Africa. And while we are based in Los Angeles, we truly are an international program. We have online components that educators can learn how to teach the program. Um, we've, our program is both in English and in Spanish, our educational curriculum, and our exhibits travel all over the world. Steph, do you wanna add anything? Uh, the only thing I would add was that we also opened an exhibit in the National Library in Vilnius, bringing David Lepkowski's artwork home uh, to where he began. And uh, that was a really um, incredible opportunity because students from the Vilnius Lyceum, one of the top uh, high schools in Vilnius, um, really learned the history of their own city that they had not known before. Um, and in doing so, they also geo-plotted the places that Lepkowski painted. And then uh, we took a group of um, adults and students to Lithuania for the opening of the exhibit. And these students were able to take us on a tour of the, really it's the downtown old center of Vilnius and um, show us exactly where he painted and tell us the story of their city that now they, when they walk on those streets, it has a completely different and deeper meaning for them. Um, and I will share that we do have a book documenting history through art and it is available on our website and it shares the four different segments of David's artwork. Um, each group of pictures very clearly segmented from life before, during the Holocaust, his time in Siberia, 
and finally his renewal in Israel. Um, I see that there's a question about the painting of the family members and if I personally knew David Lovkovsky. So I was very fortunate, yes, not only did I know him, but I got myself and my siblings got to spend a lot of time with David and Rivka, both in South Africa and in Israel. And because they never had children of their own, my mom and her siblings were like their uh, children and myself and my siblings like their grandchildren and they, they treated us like that. I see that there's another question. Um, how many pieces are there? So we know of approximately 400 pieces, but it's our guess that there possibly somewhere between 400 to 1,000 pieces of his art out there in the world. Can I add, I want to add one more thing uh, in regards to that. There, uh, in 1988, a museum of his work opened in Israel in Ramat Gan, uh, right outside of Tel Aviv. Uh, they've been doing some renovations, so it's not always open right now, but uh, there is uh, a, a museum dedicated to him and his work. And it was really, uh, took until 1988, and he died in 1991, for him to really feel um, that he was being treated as an artist and recognized for the history his work details. So um, it was really the very end of his life that he felt finally um, a sense of complete completion as an artist and um, in the telling of his story. I think those are the questions that we have. Um, so if anyone doesn't have any others, I don't know if you guys have anything else that you wanted to add as like a, a wrap up. Um, but so I just I wanted to share that you know there's there's different ways to learn but art is a universal language it's a language that doesn't have any judgment and studying the Holocaust is is very difficult but what we hope through our educational program is that the students themselves being tasked with becoming both the curators and being docents of the exhibit, that they become the educators, that they are the ones not only educating their peers and their classmates and their community, but also their own families. So it's a very active way of transferring ownership and responsibility for a very difficult and dark time. Thank you so much, uh, Leora and Stephanie. I think um, that wraps it up. What I will do is uh, send, again, everybody who has registered for the presentation will receive a follow-up email that will uh, let you know that the video is up on YouTube. And I'll also make sure that the new online exhibit link is included in that as well. Um, so that will be coming up as well. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Chapman University, for giving us this opportunity um, to, to share documenting history through art with everyone throughout the world today. Thank you.